Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, we're going to do our best, damn it. That's all I can say, Conrad. That's all I can say because it's like what time, midnight, or whatever the hell time it is right now, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> what? Why are you saying we're doing our best? Well, I mean, we're going to do our best. Don't we always? Real answer? Oh, you don't usually do your best, you're saying. Of course I do. Okay. I do better than my best. I'll over motherfucking deliver. <laughs> Every goddamn time. <laughs> and happy about it. What year are we talking about? 2005. Uh-oh. <laughs> Our topic, oh boy. our topic today is one of the most memorable Royal rumbles of all. Of course, it's Royal rumble season and eight days from now is the 2022 Royal rumble. Bruce, you nervous, anxious, excited. I know we don't talk about current stuff, but this year's Royal rumble looks like it's going to be uh, rather interesting. Absolutely. Always interesting. And of course, what an interesting story we've got in store for you today, 2005, you know, we're going to talk about. Well, how this rumble ended Vince's quads, but before we get there, I want to lighten the mood a little bit. Let's talk about the infamous and one of the best commercials WWE ever did the West side story commercial. Let's, uh, let's take a listen. I want to play a little audio from that. phenomenal commercial, but it does make me laugh every time I see it. I mean, Ray Mysterio with the wig on top of the mask, Benoit not needing to wear a wig, but these guys snapping and clapping and singing. Anybody give any pushback to that as thing on this, man, it was absolutely wonderful. It was, it was so much fun and we did it. We shot it in, uh, this is the, the shoot. Apparently, where the infamous TNA yep. uh, cookies and milk and shit. Didn't they bring balloons too? Did they bring balloons? I, never, I thought it was milk cookies and balloon. And Sahadi was kind of behind that for them, right? It may it may have been. Uh, uh, Vince and I weren't there when that happened. Right. So we came up and they said, "Oh yeah, hey, the the, 
the TNA guys uh, came over and um, they mentioned their names and we said, who? But yeah, I, I wasn't there for that. So Bruce, tell me about, you know, when, when you think about your favorite commercials that you guys shot over the years, it feels like this one and the WrestleMania, I think it was 22 when WrestleMania went Hollywood and you had all the old movie spoofs. Those are probably my two favorite series of commercials. Are there any others that stand up there with you? Oh man. You know, it's funny because I always go back to this one for a couple of reasons. One, because we shot it at universal studios and the guy that we had that was the, um, I, I guess the, the associate, uh, producer, uh, stage manager was so good and, and handled the talent so good. And, and it could have been one of those situations where you could have put somebody in there and the, the boys would have looked at him like, who the hell is this guy? Right. But this, but this guy was able to handle them very professionally and he did every move. And he would he would get down. He would snap his fingers, and he would dance, and he would do his shit, and he would sing. I mean, like he knew the commercial forward and backward, right? So he would tell everybody. He would do everybody's part for them, and it could you know it was one of those things where you're watching it at first, it's, you know, ah ha ha ha, and all that stuff, and and funny ha ha, but at the same time it's serious because you got to shoot this commercial, and this guy just I mean barreled through it. Um, I remember the, the catering people coming through with shots of espresso. I mean, it was a long shoot and, uh, just, it was, it was a pretty intense and good, good fun shoot, but everybody was having fun because it was so different. It took you out of the norm and what you'd normally do. And, 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 and guys were loving it and jumping up on the cars and, um, it was just, it was, it was a good, good, fun shoot. Bradshaw didn't need to do anything to his hair. Uh, no, <laughs> his was goofy. 1960s all the way. Just perfect. Do you remember who came up with the concept for this commercial? Hmm, man. Uh, I know John Gaborik pulled it all together there with the, the folks in universal, uh, I don't know. I, it was, it was studio folks, but I don't remember who specifically because it was just a concept that we had put together and Hey, could this work? The creative services people back at the office had come up with the poster and thought, Hey, what if we did a West side story kind of theme? And then it was a theme that carried all the way through and it just fit. It just fit. And it was, it was one of those that you never in a million years would have expected to see. And then when you saw it, you couldn't get it out of your head. Really a home run. And I'm not saying this to be funny. This had to be Pat Patterson's favorite one, right? I mean, WWE and singing that's like right up his alley. He loved to sing. Gotcha, please. I had to walk to do the my way. I did it the <laughs> my way. You do it your way. I do it my way. Hey, you know what today is January 19th. It's Pat Patterson's birthday. Isn't that cool too? I mean, as you and I are recording, it's the 30 year anniversary of the 92 rumble. And, um, it's just so fun to think about all the favorite Royal rumbles that have happened over the years and Pat Patterson's birthday, the creator of the Royal rumble. It's good timing, isn't it? It is. That's your face. Okay. Chase. So this pay-per-view is uh, right after the new year's revolution pay-per-view, which took place down in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And at the time, the vacant world title was determined in an elimination chamber match between triple H edge, Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, Batista, and Randy Orton. It's pretty crazy to think about when you look at that list of performers, it's hard to find six bigger names over the last 20 years. And then you add in. Shawn Michaels is the special guest referee. That show is also well remembered for being the show where both Eugene and Lita tore their ACLs in matches against Christian and Tyson Tomko and uh, Trish Stratus. And then Kane would pin Gene Snitsky, and Lord knows it wasn't his fault. And of course, Triple H wins the world title. And then the night after New Year's Revolution on Raw, and mind you, Batista still a member of Evolution at this point. 
Batista and Orton face off in a number one contenders match with Orton winning the right to face Hunter at the Royal rumble. So my question to you, Bruce is coming out of the pay-per-view new year's revolution. And now of course, raw, did you know at this point it was going to be triple H and Batista at WrestleMania? Was that already determined before the Royal rumble? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, five is just such an interesting year because it feels like you could have went either way with the, with either Cena or Batista. And we know, you know, because of the brand split. <laughs> yeah, you could have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, that's we're, we'll get there to that point. But anyway, I wanted to mention, uh, it's, it's written in the observer that during this era, you missed some time because your father suffered a stroke. Do you remember what your life was like in this era? Uh, my life was turned upside down during this era. Uh, my dad did not have a stroke. Imagine them getting something wrong. My dad had, had fallen and he had slipped and he dislocated his shoulder and broke his elbow, uh, actually. So when they got him into the hospital during that time, he also fell again in the hospital. And that was just kind of the, the beginning of the end. And it was pretty much every day you thought was going to be the last day. And, and, and during, during this time was a pretty sucky time for me. Well, I, um, I wish that wasn't the case. It's also mentioned in the observer that, uh, Kurt Angle, Shane McMahon, Trish Stratus, Stacy Keebler, and Shawn Michaels all went to Japan to promote the upcoming tapings there. And Shane would even discuss that they're interested in running the Tokyo dome, man. Can you imagine if that actually happened? How close? I mean, if at all, was there ever any serious conversation Did it ever look like, Hey, that might actually happen. You know, I think that the politics in Japan were such that it, it, it possibly could have, but it, at the time, I think that I don't know that it would have been a, a, a big money deal. I don't know that, that we would have been able to go over there again with what has been written about Japan and Japan's business and everything. So much of it is fantasized about and, People think, you know, one thing when in reality, business over there was something completely different and trying to do business there as an American company is, is difficult as well. So it, it just was challenging to say, the, say the very least. There's a, a tease that, um, we're going to have Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. Uh, they're going to do a standoff here, but the observer would say. For mania, at least as of this past week, angle versus undertaker was still penciled in. They really don't have to commit to anything until rumble at which point they should build the major angles. They could always do Michaels versus angle and undertaker and Kane versus Heidenreich and Snitsky. Was there ever a working plan or a consideration for taker angle at mania? That could have been fun. Yeah, it could have been fun. It could have been great. It just, uh, by that that point, I think you're just doing more for the press than anything else. Who was pushing for Kurt and Sean? Was that something that Sean was itching to do Kurt or, or maybe somebody in the back? Yeah, I think that Kurt really wanted to do it. And, you know, Sean, <laughs> you know, Sean was, was at the point in his career where he really enjoyed working and being in the ring sometimes with Kurt angle doesn't resemble anything about working. Kurt was a machine and, but at the same time, it was a clash of two different eras and two different styles that I think clashed and merged really well. So it's the beginning of Hulk Hogan, uh, being inducted into the hall of fame. How important was it to induct Hulk for WrestleMania that year? This is the WrestleMania goes Hollywood. Did that play into the thinking at all that, or was it just time you needed a headliner and it was time. It was time. And, you know, Hulk had, had come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. And when you look at LA and you look at Hollywood, I think that the talent that was inducted into the hall of fame that year from Hulk to Piper, uh, on down the line was, it made a lot of sense and Hulk made a lot of sense for Los Angeles. Uh, over on SmackDown, the show was built around a kidnapping angle with uh, Joey Giovanni and Big Show, Kurt Angle, and JBL's cabinet. 
This is a hilarious skit that you and I have had the pleasure of hearing JBL describe in great detail in some of our live shows uh, available over at adfreeshows.com. Can you sort of recap and tell everybody about the silliness of these darts you're trying to use on big show? This is fun stuff. Is it not? Well, how the hell else are you going to slow a Buffalo down? <laughs> You got to have like a blow gun, dart gun to, to tranquilize them to a man that size. You're just not going to be able to give a couple of CCs of volume and calm them down. You need a dart gun. You need a, you need technology that will stuff a Buffalo or stop a Buffalo. You could stuff a Buffalo like that too, but who knows? Oh my gosh, how silly is. It's just fun. You know, the idea that we're you I mean, I love that we get to be that creative and that silly and that fun. And I know Big Show had to have fun with this. I'm sure JBL did. It feels like Kurt would have hammed it up. What do you think Joy thought of these skits? You know, Joy was just so happy to have a job at that point. I think that um she look, Joy was still very new to the business. Yeah. And not really understanding everything that went on, but joy showed up and, and was willing to go through whatever it was we asked her to go through. So she was a very, very nice young lady. Let's, um, let's keep it going here and talk about on this same show, how the Bashams would win the tag titles from Mysterio and RVD Is it really 17 years ago. Isn't that nuts, dude? Ouch. You're old now, you know? Well, what, how old were you? You're nine. <laughs> I was 23 years old. Oh, that was uh, after you bought the, uh, first mansion. That's not true. Okay. I had, uh, no, it was your first rolls. No the second Bentley. I didn't buy a Bentley till Oh nine. Will you calm down? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is the show with the true folks, by the way, (laughs) the Bashams would win the tag titles from Mysterio and Rob Van Dam, Booker and Eddie and, uh, reigns and Jindrak. So, you know, there's some experiments. I have no idea what you just said. Exactly. Right. Luther reigns, Mark Jindrak, Eddie Guerrero, Booker T Rob Van Dam, Ray Mysterio. And with all that talent, the Bashams come out as champs. Uh, I'm always been curious, like with a big push like this on TV, why did it work out for the Bashams? You know, there's rumor and innuendo that sometimes you can, you can campaign too hard for guys. If you're a member of the office and I know Cornette was handling developmental and he was high on the Bashams and they had done well for him down there. What was it about the Bashams that just didn't translate long-term for WWE success? Uh, lack of personality. Okay. Tremendous in the rain. Um, Doug Basham, I, I think was absolutely a tremendous worker and a very good teacher as well. Uh, Danny Basham was, I think he went by damage in OVW. Another one, very good worker. They just didn't have a lot of personality, uh, separate or together. The idea was to put them together, make them a part of JBL's cabinet. JBL provided the entertainment and the personality, and you knew that they were always going to have good matches. No doubt. I mean, once the bell rang, those guys were legit, but you're saying, I mean, in hindsight, would they have done better with a a mouthpiece? Maybe if they had a manager, well, they had Layfield. You know what I mean? Like, I guess what I'm saying is let's get in a time machine. Let's go back to the mid eighties. If they had a Jimmy Hart, they had a Bobby Heenan, something like that. The, 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 the manager era, if you will, maybe that could have worked. Could have, it could have, if you gave him a Jimmy Hart or something like that. So John Cena is uh, going to defend his U S title over Kenzo Suzuki at this point. Cena- you will, and you'll clean it up. <laughs> you know, that's awful. I mean, that is like wrong on 182 levels, but the timing right there, buddy, good job. So what I do kid Kenzo Suzuki, real deal. He was also another talented in ring performer. Is it the same story? He just couldn't communicate well. And therefore he's not going to get prime time on WWE. Well, if you were going to go to central casting and, and look for a 
big international heel. I think that uh, Kenzo was right out of central casting. However, um, I don't. I I didn't think that Kenzo was that this tremendous worker, but he had a great look. He had size to him, and there was just something about him. Uh, it was more of his personal uh, life and or lack thereof that probably did him in more than anything. Nice guy. Super nice guy too. You know, we were talking earlier and, and I guess maybe we gave a spoiler, but I said, you really could have gone either way. I mean, John Cena is not yet who he is now, of course. And we realize in hindsight, Cena, for whatever reason would wind up having a, a damn peacemaker or something big time success, but the same story with Batista. Batista also has had big time success outside of WWE, but I don't think anyone would, would argue that Cena had more success in WWE. We know we're going to go with Batista. Uh, but you know, Hey, if, if you're going that direction, nothing wrong with having John Cena still rocking that U S strap. It, what was it about Batista? Do you think that made Vince go with him as opposed to Cena? Was it all about size? Was it positioning with evolution? Was it in ring work? Could you put your finger on what it was? I think that Dave had that, that it factor and Dave was able to, to go out every night and capture the imagination of the audience. So to that extent, I think Dave, it was Dave's time more than anything. So Daniel Pewter is pulled from TV and it's speculated in the observer that with Paul Heyman being taken off the writing team, he was going to have a hard time breaking through. It said that Heyman's original goal with the gold medal challenge that Kurt was doing every week with local indie di- indie guys was that Pewter would be the payoff. Now that's been refuted over the years and said, Hey, that was just a total accident. Is that how you remember it? That maybe Heyman was campaigning for Peter behind the scenes. Not that I remember ever. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't ever remember Paul really, really pushing Peter hard. You know, unfortunately in this business, every once in a while, as I, I have said before, you know, eventually that damn bell has to ring. Right. And that red light has to go on. Right. I don't know that, you know, even years later, I, I don't know that, uh, Pewter's is got the charisma to make it to the next level. And in, in, at least in this business, I, I maybe he does in other businesses and maybe elsewhere, but I don't think that he ever had that, that, Oh my God, I've got to see Daniel Pewter. Um, I just don't think he had it. And I, I don't ever remember Paul, you know, ever standing up and being, Oh my God, I've got to have Daniel Pewter. Uh, the Miz and Daniel Rodimer both turned down developmental contracts coming off of tough enough at the time. Of course, we know that they didn't wind up winning, but ultimately they both had a little moment here in the sun, but it's reported in the observer that Rodimer joked with people that Johnny Ace got him drunk and tried to get him to sign. I'm not saying that happened, but I can't wait for you to try to give me an impression of Johnny Ace trying to get a guy drunk and get him to sign. Cause that's funny. That's not funny. We try to say, Hey, you want some Malibu rum? <laughs> Come on, Connie. I bet you want some French fries. Oh, that was a bad Patterson. Oh, line. Bad. What are you doing? <laughs> you, you, you want the French fry, don't you? Now, here's the thing. If Pat had offered me a cheeseburger, I'd have ate that. You know what I mean? But I'm just not a French fry guy. You know that. So the Miz though, think about that. Boy, it all worked out. Uh, I guess it came down to just the economics from my understanding at the time, the developmental contracts were, shall we say not very substantial. So it, it get your foot in the door, get you going, but, uh, probably not exactly going to be able to take the family out to dinner every night on that sort of deal. But ultimately it worked out. Do you remember, uh, having any sort of discussions about, well, we really see something in that kid in particular talking about the miss. No, not really. I, I think that in the beginning, the feeling for Miz was that Miz just wanted to be a TV star. Miz wanted to be a reality star, not necessarily a WWE superstar. That was the internal feeling. Right. Nobody really thought that Miz had it in him to achieve all the success that that uh, he has achieved throughout the years. And I'm the first one to admit, 
I didn't see it in Miz, but by God, I'm also the first one to walk up to him and congratulate him on all the success that he has earned. You talk about somebody earning everything they've gotten. It, it's Miz. Mike Mazanin is is just that. It, and when you think of all the folks who have had success in WWE, there's a lot of folks who had, I mean, they just came out of the gate and they were successful. Like WWE saw something in them. And as people like to joke, oh, they strapped the rocket to them. That is not the case with Miz, but man, Miz is like the shining example of hanging in the pocket and seeing what's possible. He's living his best life, man. He is one of the great success stories about perseverance. Is he not? Miz was a guy that you could hand a turd to, and he would shine it into a diamond. What a compliment. Uh, the reports in the observer are that taker and Heidenreich matches on the house shows were, as they said, quote unquote, really bad. Now I know that. No, the- I, okay, I'm sorry, man. I got to take exception. Another another example of of being completely wrong. Oh, really? Those matches stunk to high heaven. <laughs> they weren't really bad. They were awful. Well, they were they were worse than awful. They were. I mean, you for if you saw that, it would take you weeks to get that stink out of your clothes. Like four years ago, though, you did get to see Heidenreich Maybe wrestle four years, but Alabama anyway. doink. I mean, Alabama yeah, doink and Heidenreich know. had a, had a five-star classic It the golden corral. <laughs> <laughs> so serious business. I see what I- folks, we got a chocolate fountain in Alabama doink. <laughs> did you ever like dip Alabama doink into the chocolate fountain? I think by the time you and I saw that he had passed away. RIP. Someone who probably wanted you to pass away at the time though, the undertaker, he, I mean, I know occasionally, uh, he will see you and, 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 and voice frustration with you had me wrestle giant Gonzalez at WrestleMania, but Heidenreich, this frozen soldier gimmick, whatever he is, this is, I mean, and the bell rang as you like to say, uh, top five. I, worst. I, I would publicly like to say to the undertaker, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's reported in the observer in a similar temporary end of a relationship. Um, WWE let the rocks deal lapse and his, his deal expired at the end of the year, December 31st. He's been there for eight years at this point. And Dwayne said, quote, the company and I are at an odd crossroad. It was an oddly quiet ending without any interaction or communication from the front office or the old man. Surprising to say the least, especially after eight years. And as a result, I guess maybe his feelings are hurt. He turns down the opportunity to participate at WrestleMania in Los Angeles. And Meltzer would say, it's not clear whether the company came to him with the planned idea for the match with JBL for the title or not. Dude, how the fuck does this happen? I mean, I, I realize he's gone and he's doing Hollywood, but there's not even a conversation. I mean, is this one of those deals where everybody's just so busy? You legitimately missed it. I don't know. JR was doing talent relations at the time. Maybe it just slipped his mind. You're not really saying that for real. No, I'm, I am. Uh, think how ludicrous that is. I think that the basic look rock was doing movies. And I think that rock management at the time wasn't keen on rock being associated with wrestling. And, you know, we knew that obviously rock knew that, but I I just think that it was, well, they didn't want him associated with wrestling because it was dangerous and he might get hurt and miss shooting or no from the aura of, Oh, he's a wrestler. Oh, they thought it was day class. A. Yes. And it just kind of didn't, you know, wasn't the image that they were trying to, to have for Dwayne. So it it just was, I think timing more than anything else. And everybody look, I I think that if we could have had a relationship with rock all the way through all the way, my God, uh, we would have 
walked over hot coals to do that. I, I think it was just kind of a mutual. I don't know that Rock was really making any effort to stay. And there were feelings on, on both sides that maybe it's time to take a break, but nobody wants to say to the other one, take a break. And things happen sometimes. Do you think this is one of those deals where Vince maybe thought, Hey, if he wants to talk to me, he'll come see me or he'll come talk to me. Or if he wants to do something, he'll let me know. And maybe the rock felt like given his success in Hollywood and that he didn't have to have this. Maybe he thought. Hey, if the old man wants me, he'll let me know. And as a result, nobody let anybody know anything. I think that that probably could have happened. I think that, you know, it, it's just lack of communication more than anything. But at the same time, I, I think that ego and, and everything else got involved, that just things happen sometimes in this business and, and in Hollywood. It's just amazing that that ego becomes a thing. Let me ask this, uh, as far as creative, you're surprised that ego becomes a thing. Have you met me? No, I'm just saying like when there's this much money involved and this much opportunity, like I never let ego get in the way. I'm like, Hey, if you need me to eat the shit to make this deal for the greater good of the company, I'm going to do what's best for business. And I guess at that point, neither Vince nor rock maybe felt like they had to. And they were like, ah, he needs me. I don't need him sort of deal. That's the vibe I get. And fuck, I don't know these guys. Yeah. I just, you know, again, it, 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 it does come down to ego sometimes. And I think that it is one of those situations where things happen. So were there ever any plans for JBL versus rock? As far as you know, probably to get the belt off of JBL and on the rock or something like that. No. Absolutely not. We would see La Resistance go over William Regal and Jonathan Coachman at a house show in Winnipeg because Eugene tore his ACL. Why La Resistance here as they're literally doing nothing of note? Why not somebody like Christian and Tom Co or the debuting Eminem with a big push in this scenario, if you had to guess? Because we're in Canada. Oh, Jeez. okay. Well, there you go. Canada. I you know, uh, I know we don't talk about current stuff anymore, but boy, what a career William Regal had pretty quietly with WWE. I mean, I think I forget what year he came back, but man, he was probably with y'all. What? Like 21, 22 years. That's a hell of a run in professional wrestling. Is it not? Absolutely. One of the bigger moments in WWE history from the observer quote raw on January 17th in Toronto was a unique show because it was clearly not a battle to advance storylines or do a good show but a battle between the writers and the wrestlers against the fans who over who was in control of this show. And boy, was it weird as a whole, the company came off really petty in this regard. Toronto drew nearly 10,000 paid, which is one of the biggest WWE crowds of the past year. And like at SummerSlam where they sold the building out, it was like the promotion almost resented its fan base. Toronto fans do have a mind of their own, but they're fairly easy to predict. Lawler spent the whole show insulting the fans calling it bizarro world. And again, complaining that after eight years, they haven't gotten over Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Where does the bizarro world comment come from? Is that a Vince line? No, I think that's an accurate description. What do you mean? I think, you know, when you, you look at, uh, like the crowds after WrestleMania and the crowds sometimes in different parts of, of Canada, they, are in their own world and they'll react in their own way. And it's, it is what it is. So you can either go with it or you can go against it. So, uh, you know, for Lawler, I think that's just, that, that's Lawler. It's, uh, they're just bizarre. Why do you think that is, you know, it's been said a lot, you know, the night after WrestleMania, Oh, these fans have a mind of their own. But then in Canada, that was certainly the case. What do you make of the comments that, and I know you're going to get hot about it, but it's gotta be at least a, a, a kernel of truth in there that maybe Vince or the powers that be, if you will resent when the crowd isn't sort of going along with the plan. That, right? is, that is probably one of the silliest, um, silliest comments I've ever heard because from a writing standpoint, from a promotional standpoint, from a talent standpoint, I've never resented a paying customer in my life. 
I appreciate everyone that, that pays and supports the promotion. I appreciate everyone that supports this podcast. So to, to make that inference to me is just absolutely ludicrous. Do you, do you wish that they would react in different ways to certain things? Of course you do. Resent? Absolutely not. That is, that is, couldn't be further from the truth. Never. I've never, ever resented an audience for participating in the show, good, bad, or indifferent. What about when they're chanting what all the fucking time? That's what they do. They're having fun. They're participating in the show. Thank you. It's a good attitude to have. Sean Michaels is going to defeat. It is. It, 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 here's the thing. Would you rather have 10,000 people chanting what, or would you rather have 10 people? I'm doing I'm, nothing. I'm not arguing. You argue. It sounds like you're arguing to me. No, I said, it's a good attitude to have. I'm being supportive. God damn it. I have good attitude. Well, I have a great attitude. Well, that's questionable. Sean Michaels is going to defeat Christian and it's announced that edge and Michaels will face off at the Royal rumble. This isn't the rated R superstar version of edge, but this is a pretty big damn deal for edge at this point in his career. Is it not? I mean, rub it up against Sean Michaels. Come on with it. Oh God. And edge is absolutely over the moon about it because it's one of those heroes that edge always dreamed of working with. The same show we would see Batista defeat, uh, viscera. That's right. Big viscera. And boy, was it one hell of a visual to see big Dave hit the spine buster on this man. He's just over like Rover. Uh, and the story is that flair is loving watching Batista improve. And of course, triple H is scared of it. This is such a super story. And, uh, it feels like it takes a village as they say. I mean, Hunter's doing his part. Rick's doing his part. Batista's doing his part. The fans are doing their part. That whole storyline is one of the better things the company produced in my opinion. Would you agree? Sure. And again, because I think people can relate to it and you, you get into a situation where you're helping someone come up and then all of a sudden, Hey, wait a minute, man. They're, they're really catching on and more people are behind them than they are me. So it was, I thought it was a great storyline played out by two guys and it kind of came from the, the feeling of whenever, you know, I always would tell the story about, uh, stone cold when stone cold saw, you know, rock catching on God damn kid, raise fucking eyebrow, have a couple of cute sayings. That don't mean you're over. And Hogan, when guys would come up and he'd go, yeah, brother, you know, that yeah, they're, they're looking good, but I don't know if they're, if they're in for the long haul, can they last and can they make it? Um, every, every top guy, when he feels those young guys nipping at their heels or feels someone coming at, up, it's only natural. You're going to look at me, oh, I don't know. Um, that was a story we were able to tell and people were able to relate to it. Well, here's something that, uh, well, didn't age well. Trish is going to come out and play the total Bret Hart Canadian baby face saying she hates being in the United States of America. This is Dave Meltzer's recap. She made fun of Lita losing her title and hurting her knee, but said there's a whole locker room full of wrestlers who would gladly impregnate her to replace her lost baby. As a reminder, that was the whole Snitsky angle. She said just be- his fault. No, not at all. She said just because her knee isn't working. Doesn't mean she can't lie on her back and that her uterus is still open for business. So Kane comes out. They're still married, I guess. And the crowd's booing Kane because Trish is the face. Now Kane is going to tease. He's going to choke slam her and, or he wasn't going to choke slam her. And instead he's going to do the right thing. But of course, eventually he does choke slam her and Meltzer would say, this will be edited out of the show in every country that has violence against women statues. This made Kane the heel for his main event with Snitsky, and it was terrible. The crowd crapped on it too. Fans did the wave and chanted go Leafs go and rejected it until the final spot. They were fighting on the entrance ramp when Kane choke slammed Snitsky off the ramp and threw a few tables. The show went off the air with both dead. Well, except Snitsky was audibly talking with Kane and asking if the spot came off. Okay. Boy of all the ways to end a raw. This probably looked good on paper, but maybe not so much an execution. Do you remember this show? I don't. Good for you. I block out painful Thank memories God. too. Yeah. 
I want to mention something because this is a, a, an interesting show where the ultimate fighter airs right after, and this is going to be a new show. The UFC is launching on spike at this point. The UFC has been hemorrhaging cash. I think they were in the whole like 30 or $40 million. And they had this idea to create a reality show. They took it to spike. They sort of self-funded most of it and they knew what they were doing at spike and they positioned it right after raw. I have to tell you, I love the first season of the ultimate fighter thought it was a great show, but I am curious, did Vince view that as some sort of competition or in Vince's mind, was it always different and didn't really care? It was always different, completely different genre and different audience. But I tell you, I think that for, you know, that that's an interesting one that, uh, if you were to interview both sides of that scenario, the folks at Viacom spike and the UFC people and, and how that whole deal came about and the feelings afterwards, um, very interesting story as well. How so? Um, well, I think that in many ways that spike really reinvigorated and helped UFC tremendously. And the feeling on the spike side was as soon as UFC and that show got over that they, they hightailed it and split. Well, and, and I think spike was looking more for, um, what, what, what's our payback? Wait a minute. We're not getting our payback on this. Hence the whole Bellator spike yeah. relationship and, and what have you. There was a lot of bad blood there with, uh, with Dana white and, and the folks at spike. How's that different from when y'all left and then and they put TNA on. Um, I don't know. Uh, probably different because we didn't, when we went to spike, they were getting it from USA. It was already, the show was made. I see what you're saying. The U S the UFC show was something that nobody wanted to touch that spike took a chance on. Got it. And built up. With us, we were already a proven entity. Did you ever see any of those early Ultimate Fighters? Yes, I did. I enjoyed it. So you you saw the whole Chris Lieben, Josh Koscheck, all that stuff. Did you ever think, hey, maybe there's an opportunity for some of those guys to do something here? There's been a, a few guys who who tried to dabble in that over the years, but it does feel like some of those guys could have been WWE characters. I mean, Chael Sonnen. My goodness, you had to love when you saw Chael, right? I mean, a smack talker, but an ass kicker. I mean, he, he yeah, is the epitome the of a thing. heel. They took guys, they took guys with personality and allowed them to talk and to get us get us through that. So you knew them. That was probably the biggest criticism, and still is to this day of UFC. Is that they don't have a lot of characters. You know, name name the UFC fighters. I, I shouldn't ask you this because you'll probably rattle off <laughs> six whole names. But um, but other than Conor McGregor, right? Who who's who's a, a UFC star? And when was and, and and then when was last time that Conor fought? When he got his ankle broken. Well, but people could say that about WWE. Uh, you know, name somebody besides John Cena, and when's the last time John Cena fought? Right, SummerSlam. Oh my gosh. Well, Connor fault too. I'm just saying that there's similarities. I think you could say in, in that every promotion, there, right? There weren't, there weren't similarities then because no, no I one knew any of the stars. Well, in no fairness, any of the fighters, Chuck Liddell was getting over, but I see what you're saying. The ultimate fighter was, was a, a springboard for, for UFC and, and they were in the red before, and now they've sold for billions of dollars and continue to be a cash cow. And I get it. Uh, SmackDown is based around Kurt Angle having to apologize for kidnapping or else he wouldn't be allowed the title match at the Royal Rumble. So let that be a lesson to you folks. If you kidnap somebody, just say you're sorry. And then you still got a shot at the title. Uh, JBL and go ahead. How long are you going to hold a grudge? Well, that's a fair question. All right. I'm sorry. Um, JBL and show come together because of what angle did and how it was so wrong. But of course, at the end of the show, JBL turned on show and it was a massive heel beatdown that left big show bloody. And there's not a lot of heat here. Uh, it is a big angle and it seems weird that the audience, do you think at this point, 
perhaps the big show had been good guy, bad guy, good, good guy, bad. It just flip flopped so much that fans were starting to tune out a little bit and it was hard to, or is it just hard to have a sympathetic baby face when you're damn a giant? I think it's hard to feel any sympathy for a seven foot giant. Yeah. It's reported in the observer that the Shane twins were signed to be placed on TV immediately on the SmackDown side. These are two big dudes who were twins and they're going to do the old switching in and out gimmick. what did you think of them? And, and did you think they were TV ready? Well, you know, great guys love the business. They were, I think Steve Kern trained them or something, but I know Steve Kern recommended them. Um, Dean Malenko trained them. I first saw them in TNA. I think they were the Johnsons or the Dicks or something. Oh, they were the Johnsons. It was Dick Johnson and Rod Johnson. And they dressed like penises and now they're the Shane twins for you guys. Yeah. I feel about the same way about them. (laughs) (laughs) Is this the same thing as the Basham? Odorless, colorless. Yeah. Wait, your Peters are odorless and colorless. Definitely odorless. You're doing a little baby powder gimmick. I wash Conrad. I was just trying to get you to talk about your uh, hashtag Rick Rude's dong. So there's a press conference between Steve Austin and Vince McMahon regarding a movie deal. Now, not trying to play a conspiracy theorist, but is the timing of this a coincidence with everything that was going on at the rock at the time? It was a coincidence in that we were doing the Steve Austin movie at the time. Do you think? No, it was, it had nothing to do with the rock at all, but you know that they probably thought that, right? Who's they? Well, hypothetically, it's been said over the years that Steve and Dwayne were pretty competitive with each other. And I know at this point they're no longer in ring, but still it does feel like there's a little bit of competitiveness between them. Is there not? I'm sure there always has been. From this G- was more of this was more of a WWE studio saying than anything. This had ap- uh, no, abs- it had absolutely zero. Oh my God, well, Rock's not going to join. So we'll get Steve to do a movie. Zero, zero truth to that in any way, shape, or form. You got to get hot about it. I am hot about it. But why? Because now you made me hot. What's your favorite Steve Austin movie? Condemned. I think that's everybody's answer, isn't it? Yes, I fucking loved it. So the genu- I seriously think if there was a way, I, and I really do believe this, if there was a way that a little bit of that violence could have been edited out of that movie and that been uh, released PG, that it would have done much better, would have been much more uh, better received. But it was it was pretty violent, pretty gory, and um, I I enjoyed the hell out of it. I thought it was a great movie. I agree. The January twenty fourth episode of Raw begins with a recap from Meltzer saying, "No matter who you are or how legendary you are, when you come on Raw, you can only be humiliated." We should mention this is Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's Jim Ross Day. They're going to show him being honored. He's going to talk about how much he loves Oklahoma and the Sooners. Stacy Keebler is going to talk about, come out and talk about how it's Jim Ross day here in Oklahoma. And she's going to bring to the ring, Danny Hodge, who was JR's legit favorite wrestler growing up at this point, Hodge was 72 and he leaps over the top rope to get in the ring and gets a nice reaction. Ross gives the perfect thank you speech to the point. I really wish they wouldn't have messed it up by doing an angle, but I knew better. I wonder what other form of entertainment fills the need to always humiliate people who are former legends. Triple H and flair came out. Triple H did a great job here of being the ultimate prick. He told Ross that and father Tom to run along because he wanted to talk to Keebler. They leave and he grabs Keebler by the wrist and starts threatening to abuse her. Ross jumps in to make the save while he gets insulted some more by triple H flair gives Jr. a low blow. And then Hodge runs in for the saves and deck triple H, which gets a big pop. And then flair blindsides him and they stomp the hell out of Hodge. So listen, I kind of get this because we're getting heat and, and the, and the guys probably enjoyed it, especially Mr. Hodge. Cause Oh, I'm in a wrestling angle or whatever, but 
is there anything wrong with just some old fashioned, Hey, let's honor our legends. And by the way, I don't think this could ever happen today. I don't think WWE would allow a 72 year old to do this, but in hindsight, do you wish you would have handled this one a little differently or did it accomplish what you were looking for? No, I don't wish we'd handled it any differently. I, it, it's an entertainment show. You have good guys and you have bad guys. You want people to dislike your bad guys. So you have them do things that are unscrupulous to good guys. That's what this was. Now, if Meltzer can't understand that, then, oh gosh, he doesn't understand the business. Wait a minute. What am I saying? Um, it was traditional good versus evil. It was the good guys getting people to hate them even more. And taking a local crowd and adding to that for the adjuration that the local crowd had for the people that they were beating up. How hard is that to understand? Well, it leads to a Randy Orton save, but my goodness, uh, how much do you think uh, Hunter and Flair enjoyed working with Hodge and, and Hodge had to be thrilled doing it, didn't he? Oh, absolutely loved it. And, you know, here's here's the thing. Danny Hodge was 72 years old when this took place. Uh, I don't think Michael Hayes is 72 years old yet, but about apparently about, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, Michael went to jump over the top of the garden Yeah, and couldn't make it over and took a big bump. And Danny Hodge at 72 had no problem getting over that top rope. You just wanted to make sure that he shit on Dave, Dave, Dave. I appreciate that even though he doesn't, What's that? I appreciate that even though he doesn't listen every week, you want to make sure on the off chance he does, he hears a little dig. That's fun. Because no, because no, because it's, I still love, and I, I love being able to catch Michael out of the side of his eye and look at him and go, Oh, duh, 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 because it just tickles us to no end that people now go up to the world famous Michael Hayes, uh, one of the all time legends and greatest that has ever been in this business and look at him and just go, Oh, duh, duh, duh. I think that's funny. Uh, in the main event, Hey, I couldn't jump over the top row. It's fucking 22. And you probably didn't sell out the Superdome when you were 11. 11 months. I sold that when I was in the womb. Do, do, do. Orton beats flair in the main event here. And we continue with the story all night about the differences between Batista and Hunter. Um, in hindsight, Orton's big crowning moment was SummerSlam 04. He probably could have been in this spot, but he wasn't. Is that just maturity? Was it just timing? Was there anything Orton could have done differently early in his career here when he had that early success? Because now Batista is going to be the man. And you could have argued at the time, since he got the belt first, it should have been Orton. I don't know. I don't know if Randy was ready for it at that point. I just think, you know, uh, maturity wise, age wise, everything else. I don't know that Randy, I don't know that Randy was really ready for it and be able to handle it. And Dave, I think maturity wise was in a little different level. So the SmackDown go home show, as we march towards Royal rumble, Oh five has Heidenreich reading a poem and then takers music hits and a casket gets a casket gets wheeled out and Heidenreich powders out. Wouldn't you? Yes. Uh, angle versus JBL is the main event. It ends when both men knock each other uh, out and that builds towards the three way here at the uh, rumble. And it's in the observer that there were talks of bringing back mean Gene and Bobby Heenan to host the hall of fame. Was that something that was talked about internally, or is it because Hogan's going to be the focus and they were associated with him for so long. So it just made sense. Yeah. I think that when you look at the nostalgia end of it, that Okerlund and, and Hogan go hand in hand, as does Bobby Heenan, even before the WWE days and in the AWA with Heenan and Oakland and everybody, they were synonymous with Hulk Hogan. I want to mention, um, Batista does an interview in the media prior to the rumble. And it's said here, quote, I don't consider it a rivalry. He's talking about SmackDown and raw at all. 
we're a better show period. There's no comparison. I feel sorry for SmackDown. I just don't know what's going on over there. I try to watch the shows, but for me, they're hard to sit through. And that really makes me sick as it should be a top show. I've watched their tapings live and it seems like a lot of the guys couldn't care less. There's a lack of passion and pride. They need the stress of a live show on them. Like we have a lot of them think, oh, it's taped. If I mess up, we'll just redo it. They're more worried about where they're going after the show, which also makes me sick because it means they're not here to work. And I'm curious from your perspective, Bruce, part of the company's approach to this has to be, oh man, that's good. That's competitive. We like when, when folks are competing and people are a little uncomfortable, that's when they're going to do their best work. I get that. But on the other hand, if you're in the media saying, man, that show sucks and it's your own show. Maybe that's not the right approach. what do you think of these comments? Yeah, I think it's a, a poor choice of what he said. I don't think that, you know, you have a way you can put yourself over and you put other people over in the process and that's how everybody gets over and an extremely just poor choice on his part. What do you think? Um, you know, Meltzer writes this, you know, this isn't being said without triple H's approval and it actually speaks volumes about many things. He's not wrong either, as there is a difference. Did you uh, feel well, that? That shows that Dave Meltzer has no idea what Hunter approves and doesn't approve. I, I couldn't see in a million years Hunter approving that. Let's, or approving of it. Right. But did you feel that way? Did you feel like SmackDown was, as we like to say in the South, lollygagging a little bit? No, I don't. Um, Absolutely not. Batista's never been one to really care what people think or bite his tongue. Do you remember there ever being a time where the company ever had to go to him and say, Hey man, what the fuck? Got to ratchet some of this back. Sure. On several occasions, I think that there have been times where Dave has been talked to about different things, but, uh, you know, Dave was out there and, and learning as he goes, you gotta, you gotta remember Dave was still green here too. Right. Well, Bruce, we're here now. It's the 05 Royal Rumble. It took place on January 30th from uh, the Save Mart Center at Fresno State. There's 12,000 folks here. The show's going to get 575,000 buys. Now, compared to the 04 Royal Rumble, which was Hunter and Sean in a last man standing match and Benoit winning the Rumble in Philly, they got 582,000 buys. So, not really a, a drop off of any substance. But this is a smaller arena than the one we're used to for the rumble. Is this more a matter in your opinion of timing and scheduling or did the company not have confidence that they could run a bigger arena at this era? Oh my God. No, we were going to Japan. It was rowdy. You ain't got to get hot about it. You know, I get hot because the inference is, oh, we don't have confidence. We're not going to run a building. That's that doesn't exist. Well, just so you know. There are larger arenas than uh, Fresno state in California. So, okay. Are there larger arenas with better deals than what we got at Fresno state? Well, that's why I was asking. And then, I mean, I fr put that in the question and it's then you rowdy. got pissed about it's rowdy. It's routing. It's deals. It has a lot more to do than just, there's a lot that goes into it. Believe it or not. There's not just one guy with a dart in a dartboard at a fucking with the goddamn map of the United States of America. God bless America. Just hit whatever we hit. It's actually what Ed Cohen used to do. He had a big, <laughs> actually did have <laughs> a, big, <laughs> a big giant map of the United States on his wall and had a dart. We would just throw darts at the, at the wall. I, I mean, I do remember. Yeah, that's where we're going tomorrow. Book it. The show is well received by the observer. As we're talking about the Royal rumble here in 05, 79.3% thumbs up. And the opening match is Shawn Michaels and edge. How about that for a, a fucking pay-per-view open? What a big time match that is edge and Shawn Michaels. Couple of curtain jerkers. So they go 18 minutes and 32 Great seconds match. and unbelievably edge gets the win. Um, Meltzer would say the match was good, but edge had so many better matches over the past year that it had to be a disappointment. Michael's body language, superstar aura and facials are what is carrying him more than the athletic ability that made him where he is. There are some timing issues here that you wouldn't expect. 
Edge got the advantage doing the execution on the floor. Edge was bleeding after slicing his forearm, and then there were a series of near falls. Edge delivered a spear on the floor, then threw Michaels in and nailed him with a perfect spear in the middle, but Sean kicked out. Edge acted like he was going nuts, actually pulling his hair out of his head like he had mentally lost it. Edge later used his yet unnamed lasso from Toronto submission, but Michaels made the ropes. By this point, Edge was bleeding from the mouth as well. The finish saw Michaels do a Japanese rolling crotch hold, but Edge rolled with it, held both the ropes and the tights and got the pin three and a quarter stars. Bruce, when's the last time you executed a Japanese rolling crotch hold? Last night. Did you get put over? See, I was up because see, I was up in the in the guest bedroom, and it's got one of them mattresses that are kind of funky, and so I, before I knew it, I had my Japanese crotch by the hole. Okay, this is a big win for Edge, not just as a character, it's because but... they're painting or anyway. I just didn't want y'all thinking there was anything strange going on. I mean, what y'all do is your business, you know. And then seriously, when you, when you and Stephanie were here last time, I mean, Megan had to get the painters out. We had to patch the sheetrock upstairs. Well, that's what I'm doing now. I mean, you need to slow down tiger, get off the blue chew. Well, you know, this is a a real big win for edge. Uh, not just the character, but I mean, the guy in his career, he had to love working with Sean and getting a win. Do you think he or Sean were disappointed with the match? No, I think, and, and, you know, here's, this is to me, it's just kind of funny when they talk about, oh, there were missed spots or there were, you know, whatever. When you watch something, it's like people, oh, that was real or things like that. If it is too smooth, if it is too, everything's perfect, everything's smooth and pretty and all this shit to me. I think that's worse than things that missed or intentional or whatever, but they look real. I, I don't think that people move pretty all the time. I think when you watch a, a football game and a guy, wouldn't it be so much prettier if, if everybody hit their blocks and we ran for a touchdown that was picture perfect and barely uh, missed the guy as he ran? No, it's clunky. It's weird. It's different. Give you the illusion of this is real and this is different. Uh, I don't think either guy was disappointed because there was nothing to be disappointed in. You got two great guys uh, from different eras clashing, and I thought they, they had a hell of a match. Next up, one of your favorites. The Undertaker is going to beat John Heidenreich in a casket match in 13 minutes and 20 seconds. I kind of would have liked to have seen John Heidenreich win this casket match at the Royal Rumble and send The Undertaker back to heaven, but it didn't happen here. Why would you want that? Oh, it was just fun seeing the undertaker float to the sky. Well, because they, because you're from Alabama and doink and Heidenreich, Alabama doink legends. Had, they, they had, they had bad blood back then. Didn't they Conrad? It's been a classic my whole life. Didn't you? Uh, this match yeah. is preceded by Heidenreich and <laughs> Gene Snitsky skit. There's these two horrible giants snarling, telling each other how much they like each other. Heidenreich tells him. Hey, I like you, Snitsky, but I hate caskets. And Snitsky says he has a plan. Meltzer says if the plan was to cancel this match, it would have been a hell of an idea. Snitsky ran in early and they did a double team using a missed time, double suplex on the undertaker. So he landed badly and you really have to feel so sorry for him trying to make lemonade unsuccessfully out of these matches. They went to roll him in the casket, but they opened the lid and a bandaged up cane was there. Kane cleaned house for a while until he paired up with Snitsky. Kane and Snitsky brawled, and the scary part was this was the hottest part of the match. They ended up brawling out of the ring. It was your typical casket match, except worse from here. Heidenreich got Undertaker in, but he blocked slamming the door on two occasions, and the finish was really bad. The first came, or first came a botched DDT spot, and then the Undertaker lost Heidenreich on the choke slam. Both times it was Heidenreich's doing. And finally, Undertaker used the tombstone and rolled him in the casket, three quarters of a star. So it was, uh, as JR used to say, bowling shoe ugly. 
Undertaker walks through the curtain. Does he just shoot you the death stare right away? Yeah, not pretty. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it was terrible uh, <laughs> to say anything. And, and you know, here's the crazy thing, man. Uh, and we, we make fun of Hyde and Reich and have fun with him. And John is is uh, super. I mean, he, he's he's almost childlike in his innocence sometimes, and, and just being nice. I, and I don't remember if you were there uh, when it happened, and you might have come by afterwards. But I was doing an autograph signing in Orlando at WrestleMania, uh, for, for an Orlando WrestleMania and the, the contract signing was, I mean, the autograph signing was someplace else in Heidenreich and the Alabama doink guy got into a fight, but it wasn't, he wasn't all dressed up as Alabama doink. He was just whoever the guy is that was Alabama doink running the thing. And he and, uh, Heidenreich got into an argument over money. And Heidenreich like broke a table and threatened to beat the crap out of the guy. And the guy, you know, took off running and all this stuff and people were around. And I just happened to be like across the aisle and down a little ways. And as John came down and he, and he saw me sitting there and he stops cold. Like he's, he looks like he's ready to kill someone. And he probably was, if he could have got his hands on the guy that portrayed the Alabama doing, um, and he just stops and looks at me and goes, oh, hey, Bruce. Hey, man, how you doing? I'm so sorry you had to see that. This fucking guy uh, stole money from me and promised me X amount of money. When I asked him for my money, he told me he didn't have it. I said, well, you better get it. And he starts getting all worked up again. And then he just puts his shoulders down and goes, man, I'm so sorry you had to see that. And like look, throws his hands up in the air like, oh, damn it. And then just walked off into the into the crowd and disappeared. And I didn't see him for the rest of the time. And that's, you know, John just is kind of a very innocent, very nice soul. But a little crazy. Next up, JBL is going to retain the WWE title in a three way over Kurt Angle and Big Show at 12 minutes and four seconds. Uh, Angle would hit show with a TV monitor while he's standing on the ring steps and show falls backwards with an ST plunge bump through the SmackDown announcers table and show only sold being out for two minutes before he makes the comeback angle. Isn't able to carry a match with guys like this all by himself anymore. Show did a running tackle, sending JBL through the barricades. They brought out a stretcher for him. And then the Bashams came out angle, tried to bring in a chair, but show flapjacks angle on the chair and has a beat. But Mark Jindrak pulls the ref out of the ring and then Luther Reigns attacks show as Reigns and Jindrak are beating up show JBL staggers into the ring and does a clothesline on angle to pin him. And it was almost a baby face turn tease because Cole was putting over JBL as a survivor star in three quarters, man, this is just weird. The idea that we're trying to sell that, oh, he's a survivor. When in reality, he's a heel who set all this up, but the match just didn't click. The idea that Kurt angle had a pay-per-view match that only got a star in three quarters. How much of that is just these guys didn't click. And how much is it? Three ways are just a clusterfuck. Three ways are a clusterfuck. And and I just don't know that. Yeah, it just was a cluster. And I think that the overall foundation of the match didn't work. That's all. It's just, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, triple H is going to pin Randy Orton in uh, 21 minutes and 28 seconds to keep the title. They get three and a quarter stars. Um, Meltzer would say it was clear. They were limiting the interference to the two matches. They felt needed it more. I thought the only ending here was Batista beating Orton and saving the title for triple H, but instead they went with triple H over strong. They might've as well, since triple H has been booked as the face who overcomes the odds more, most weeks anyway. And the crowd was chanting things like Randy sucks and Orton's a pussy. Wow. Uh, triple H constantly out. Fox Orton, man, you know, names hurt words, hurt words, hurt words, hurt. That's right. Triple H constantly outfoxes Orton when he'd go for the RKO. And most of the match was Triple H working on Orton's legs. They tried to push the idea that Orton had knee damage from a recent match. Orton got a bloody mouth after the requisite Hebner ref bump. Triple H grabbed the sledgehammer. Orton stopped him from using it and posted Triple H who juiced. Orton went for a DDT, but Triple H held onto the ropes and Orton hit his head on the mat. 
Orton did a great job selling the idea that he had a concussion as his eyes were glazed over. And that was kind of his out that he was even while out on his feet, continuing to fight. Triple H then pinned him after a pedigree three and a quarter stars. In hindsight, do you think it would have made more sense to have Batista interfere a little bit here? No. You like you didn't have you didn't have your you didn't have your Batista win yet. So again, I think you would have been foreshadowing. You didn't need it. You already had the story being told, and and again, it just adds to the story all that much more. You didn't need it. But I thought it was an absolutely excellent match, and you know you go back and you look at how great Randy was then when he was a kid, still you know learning and still very young, um, was an absolute prodigy. Next up, a great little segment backstage happens. Ric Flair and Eddie Guerrero are doing a backstage segment where they're drawing numbers and Flair obviously draws a good number and Eddie gives him a handshake and steals it. Classic Eddie line, cheating, stealing. Great segment. Is this Brian's writing? Cause this is fun. I'm sure it was me. Great. Glad to hear that. Yeah. So I did. Brian didn't do shit. <laughs> uh, next up. It's time for the actual rumble. Batista is going to win as we know, and we're going to talk about all of it, but it goes 51 Why is it minutes. Whenever it's good shit. Oh, is that Brian doing it? He ain't going to put you on young rock, man. I don't want to be on. Okay. I, that well, would be uh, kind of fun to be on your No, what I mean is though, the comedy stuff I've always credited. I mean, I've never known what, you to I'm be not funny on this show. I don't know about that. Hilarious. I know you are, but is your writing name? One funny thing you, you wrote on WWE TV ever in your life. That right there. Okay. Besides that, anything, love. what was that brother love? No, no, not your performance. Something you wrote for other people. That was well, funny. I, who the hell you think was writing that? Everything good. I did everything bad was Brian, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So Batista wins 51, 27 and Meltzer would say, this is probably the first Royal rumble that Pat Patterson, who created the event, wasn't heavily involved in putting together. For the record, Patterson wasn't even at the show. He was in Tampa at the wrestle reunion. Bruce, I know it was a long time ago, but from your recollection, is this the first rumble you remember Pat missing? Uh, no, I think he's missed. I think he missed a few, few before this, maybe at least one or two before this, at least talk, talk to I always love to, I always love to have Pat back in though, to pick his brain and, and go over it even, even just once a year to have him there for it. That, but that was selfish on my part. Cause I loved working with Pat. What's the magic to putting together a rumble? Uh, <laughs> patience, <laughs> patience is, is one and, um, no pride of authorship. You have to, you probably will tear up half dozen before before you really start to get a feel because you you have to you you get parts and you get you get things in your head but they don't always fit where you want them to it's just patience more than anything i'm just curious how it all gets put together because we know there's going to be little storylines within it let's get started number one eddie guerrero 28 minutes and 11 seconds is what he's going to last he's going to have four eliminations uh, he's representing SmackDown and he's out. Number one, number two is going to be Chris Benoit and, uh, he's going to last 47 minutes and 26 seconds. He'll have two eliminations, but that means we start with some badass hard wrestling, at least two minutes worth to get us started. And then Daniel pewter comes in at number three. And when he does, well, he sort of gets the initiation treatment. It seems like Eddie and Chris Benoit just sort of forget about each other. And take turns throwing some brutal chops, Mr. Pewter's way. And then Bob Holly comes in at number four and boy, is he grinning like a possum. He is so excited to be in here. Uh, he's going to give even more hard chops to Pewter. And then Pewter takes a back suplex from Benoit, the three vertical suplexes from Guerrero and the Alabama slam from Bob Holly before being the first one out at six minutes and two seconds. Meltzer would say Peter was knocked silly because he was laying on the ground for several minutes and barely moving. Some of it must have been selling because nobody attended to him, but he was laying out there a long time and it was never shown on camera. Holly's usefulness was over at that point, 
So rather than risk him hurting somebody important, Benoit and Guerrero dumped him at six minutes and 11 seconds, just as hurricane came in. So let's just stop right there. We've all acknowledged that maybe Daniel Peter wasn't yet ready for prime time, but he's in a bank, a big spot here on the rumble against Eddie and Benoit who just chopped the shit out of him. And then Bob Holly, man, he does some more. This in hindsight looks kind of bad. What do you think of this? Why does it look, I mean, why does it look bad? It's a brand new guy coming in who is a rookie. Who's just starting out with two of your top guys that beat the hell out of him. And a third guy comes in and beats the hell out of him because he's a rookie. You're not expecting him to do anything. If he did anything, nobody knows how it's going to look. It was the safest, most logical thing to do and then get him the hell out of the ring. So what else would you do? What else would you do with him? Risk him uh, hurting other people and being in there longer where he doesn't really know what he was doing or not put him in there. Well, again, get him some exposure. Let's see what the hell if there is anything. It, it's, you know, six and one half dozen. You damned. If you do, you damned. If you don't, you gotta get hot about it. I am hot about it. So what's coming up next There's a brawl between raw and SmackDown guys four versus four, which ends when Muhammad Hassan comes out and everybody stops brawling and dumps him, which really puts him over as the, the super heel. Uh, that's all for Meltzer's write up. I should mention he came in at number 13, only last 54 seconds. Uh, Booker T Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho edge, Luther Reigns, and Shelton Benjamin would dump him out. That's really the most notable thing that happened here. Uh, I guess I should mention hurricane lasted a minute and four seconds. Eddie Guerrero threw him out. What's up with that? Kenzo Suzuki, uh, is eliminated by Rey Mysterio after three minutes and 31 seconds. Edge lasts 40 minutes and 19 seconds at number seven. He has five eliminations. Rey Mysterio, uh, is, is eliminated by edge after 38 minutes and 25 seconds with one elimination. Shelton Benjamin is also eliminated by edge, but he lasts 1435. Booker T, uh, comes in and, uh, last 10 minutes and 42 seconds. And, uh, he's going to have three eliminations. Jericho comes in and is ultimately eliminated by Batista after 28 minutes and 22 seconds. He picked up two eliminations. Luther reigns, a name we don't spend a lot of time talking about is eliminated by Booker T after seven minutes and 13 seconds. Got any good Luther stories you could share with us. He had a horseshoe on his head. That's about it. Right. There you go. Uh, After him is the Muhammad Hassan thing we were talking about, which really made him sort of the super mega heel, which I guess is a good spot to be in for him. Orlando Jordan is out next. He's going to last three minutes and 36 seconds before he's eliminated by Booker T. Uh, Scotty too was attacked by Muhammad Hassan before entering the ring. So he was entrant number 15, but he was never actually eliminated. So I want to say right now in a loud and clear voice, we need justice for Scotty too hotty in my mind's eye. We're going to have to have Batista and Scotty too hotty settle this like men. Can you put them in a match at WrestleMania to just settle the score here once and for all? No. Would you consider it? Just did. No. How about a little longer? No, (sighs) no. I want to mention, uh, Eddie Guerrero gets thrown out after 28 minutes and 16 seconds. He's thrown out by edge, which gets a huge amount of heat. And right in after that is Shawn Michaels to help get the match back focused. I mean, that's pretty well done. And then right after Kurt angle comes in for 47 seconds, which is enough to suplex almost everybody before Shawn Michaels super kicks him out, which is really awesome. I mean, what a great way to get somebody over in 47 seconds. He comes and kicks everybody's ass, but then gets caught slipping. And then of course, angle attacks Sean, which eliminates him illegally busts him open. And now their WrestleMania program has started. This is, this is a, a, a Royal rumble that's put together really damn well. Thank you. Next up. Charlie Haas is going to come out. He's going to last 16 minutes and 20 seconds. Rene Dupree is going to uh, last 11 minutes and 32 seconds. Jericho is going to eliminate him. Your boy, Simon Dean lasts 20 seconds. Uh, Sean Michaels eliminates him. As we mentioned, Sean Michaels is out at 19. He's going to get eliminated by Kurt angle. Uh, Kurt angle is uh, also going to be eliminated by Sean Michaels. 
And then coachman is out. He's eliminated by Ric Flair, but coach lasted 13 minutes and 48 seconds. Are you guys just fucking with coach here to let him last that long? This is hilarious. The hell of an athlete. Oh my, I love you for that. Uh, next up, Mark Jindrak. He's going to come in last eight minutes and 15 seconds. Viscera is in, uh, with John Cena eliminating him after three minutes. Then Paul London at number 24, Snitsky would eliminate him after three minutes and 15 seconds. John Cena is out and last 15, 28. We'll come back to that. Snitsky is going to be eliminated in three minutes and 38 seconds by Batista. Kane's out. Thanks to John Cena in 354. Batista was number 28. And he lasts 10 minutes and 54 seconds. Christian is going to be out at number 29. Batista dumps him out after two minutes and nine seconds. And Ric Flair really did have the best number that night. He comes out at number 30 edge eliminates him after one minute and 58 seconds. I want to mention, uh, the Paul London spot here. Gene Snitsky is, um, going to go ahead and receive Paul London doing the clothesline off the apron and a shooting star flip on the floor. And what's bad about it is they had a camera shot on London being put on the stretcher. And the EMTs are taking no care of him. And they literally threw him on with no immobilization. So it was almost a comedy movie spot. Meltzer says it would have taken very little quality control to have made that one believable booking. Of course, he's being critical of something here, but I guess if you're going to bring the stretcher out, you probably ought to make the shit look legitimate. Huh? That's Northern California stretcher operators. So I, you know, so the final four. Come down to Batista, Edge, Mysterio, and Cena. So it's always been said that, boy, the company has big plans for the final four. And these are four big time stars. Edge eliminates Mysterio. And then Batista and Cena both eliminate Edge and we're down to two. And Meltzer would say, while the crowd was more for Batista, they didn't boo Cena. That wasn't a risk worth taking. And here's why we're all here. Meltzer would write, in actuality, the Royal Rumble finish was botched. John Cena was simply supposed to escape from the power bomb the first time, but later get power bombed and thrown over the top clean. Instead, they both lost balance and tumbled over the top rope. The referees had no idea what to do. And Vince McMahon was in the back on the headsets, basically directing everything that happened. At first, the referees raised Batista's hand as the winner, as was planned. When it became clear that Batista actually hit the ground first. Vince ordered the referees to do the tie finish with the SmackDown referees calling it for Cena and the raw referees calling for Batista. He then said he was coming out and that explains why no music was cued for Vince. So let's walk through the first part is, is the way he broke it down pretty much the way you remember it was supposed to be two power bombs. The second one goes out clean and they just lost their balance. And here we are. Well, Cena was supposed to supposed to go out. I don't remember all the machinations up to it, other than John was John was slated to go out um, by Batista at the end, and they just both went over at the same time. Uh, what goes on at um, Gorilla when they tumble over? Well, fuck. That's what goes on. Um, you know, it's like okay, uh, let's see who hit. Maybe, maybe Cena hit first, therefore Batista wins and you're good to go. And I think Dave hit first. So it was like, okay, well, can the argument be made that they hit at the same time? And all this is happening in a matter of seconds. It's not like, okay, stop everything down. Now let's figure out what to do. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out as you go. And, um, it's like, okay, tell the SmackDown guy to raise, John's hand till the raw guy to raise Batista's hand. We got, you know, and we're thinking, okay, shit, maybe we can get to a match or you know what? Just start it over. <laughs> and before you know it, Vince is out and Vince is headed down to the ring to figure it out. And I, I don't know that we necessarily had exactly what we wanted to do uh, before Vince went out because Vince just bolted out and went to the ring and then when he slid in the ring, uh, nobody could figure out why the hell he, he didn't get up. He just sat on the, on the damn so, mat. So you couldn't tell right away that everybody. he had banged himself. 
What's that? You couldn't tell right away on the monitor that he had hit his leg getting in, right? No, yeah, we didn't. I don't remember seeing him slide in. Also, you know, again, we're trying to do a million different things and talk to a million different people, trying to figure out what to do. And you look up, and Vince is sitting on the on the apron, yelling at everybody. And it's like, okay, what the hell's going on here? And we restarted the match and got our finish. Meltzer says instead, after far too long period of indecisiveness, Vince McMahon came to the ring doing the Vince walk as Vince tried to slide in the ring. Like a wrestler, he didn't get high enough and smashed his right knee on the apron. As he tried to recover, he climbed through the ropes, took a step on his right leg and collapsed while sitting down, unable to get up. He started pantomiming about what to do. The show was way over time by this point, as they had been shaving time throughout the Royal rumble because the undercard had already went long. While trying to explain and unable to stand, Cena and Batista threw each other once over the top. By the time it was restarted, the show had run way too long, and the two had to simply have Batista powerbomb Cena and throw him out in 16 seconds, making for a weak ending, particularly as it regarded Cena, who was scheduled to face JBL for the SmackDown title, and this clearly made him a secondary challenger and that a secondary title match. So... You're seeing Vince sitting in the ring. Panic is setting in. And listen, we've discussed everything that's happening and going on. And I know that they've got to just come up with something on the fly, but what the hell happens when Vince walks back through the curtain? Uh, you know, Vince just, just came back and the fact that, you know, he walked and nobody knew, nobody knew what happened at all. You know, it, it's we're doing our thing and it's before you know it, um, match starts. We get our finish. We, we go home and, and Vince came back and sat down and, um, trainer came over to talk to him and everybody gave him his privacy and left. I mean, that's it. You know, there was no, there was no big dramatics or anything like that. Uh, at that point, and he was obviously hurt. Right. We, we could see that he was hurt, but nobody knew how he got hurt. No one knew really what the injury was. We thought he like blew out his knee or something, you know, maybe sliding into the ring. He hit the edge of the ring and maybe blew his knee out somehow. Um, but you know, they asked for privacy and we all left. So no one knew what his injury was, how bad his injury was, or even how the injury happened. You know, didn't know that till God long after the fact. So it was just kind of a, okay, well, Vince banged his knee. They'll get him back there and take a look at him. And, uh, and let's, let's go. Got to go to Japan in the morning. The word that is as we've always heard is as he's trying to no sell it, he winds up putting more pressure on the other leg, fucks up that leg even worse somehow. And I think you've told us a story before that you could actually, you know, I know. It's yeah. Pain. I mean, I heard a guttural scream, but again, it, it was, I think Vince, you know, look, he, he walked back from the ring. Right. Which is in and of itself is, is a miracle <laughs> and, and, then, and foolish. Right. I mean, good Lord yeah, and foolish. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when he, when he came back and, uh, got down the stairs I, and again, I, I didn't see it. I don't think anybody saw it. Right. Um, except for probably the doctor and the trainer that was with him. But I remember being down the hall near his office, um, and heard just this horrific, like, how like ha you know and and it was like what the fuck was that right and you know trying to trying to walk and trying to get back i think that he just he all that pressure on the other leg that that one went and so now you know he he pulled um pulled both his quads and shit was on but uh, you know we didn't even know that you know nobody really knew until much later you know, in the evening, the, the extent of his injuries. And really at that point, all we knew was that, Hey, he's going to go and, uh, have this, have this looked at and 
probably going to have to have some surgery, so he's not going to go to Japan. And uh, you guys have a good trip. So nobody knew until long after the fact uh, that he, he had torn both quads and was uh, in a great deal of pain. Because everybody's like, he was walking! You know, because <laughs> I don't ever want to experience it myself, but I can only imagine, you know, trying to trying to do that. I doubt I'd be able to walk. Meltzer would say, and what may be the most important story, McMahon's noticeable aging has become concerning. It was never something talked about, and now barely a days go by when somebody doesn't bring it up. McMahon turned 60 in August, but the past few months, there was the first time you really ever heard people talk about what happens to the business after events. It's a scary proposition because for all the positives and the negatives that can be said about the person who is ultimately the greatest promoter in the history of this industry. And at many times a creative genius, you'll find almost nobody who understands wrestling. who isn't very concerned about pro wrestling when in the U S when he's no longer in control. And here we are 17 years later and Vince is like a fucking bionic human on some level. Cause he's still going, I mean, I know we're both tickled that he's still going by the way, but hypothetically, would you have ever imagined he would still be doing WWE in 2022? Yes. It's just hard to imagine Absolutely. him not doing it. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine him not doing it. And, and I'm sure that he will continue to do it probably for the next 25 to 30 years. Um, his mom's 101. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and still going. So you know, he shows no signs of slowing down at all. And he's a freak of nature. And it's, yeah, it's hard to imagine it ever without him. And I don't think that we'll have to imagine it without him for a long, long time. So you don't buy into the rumor and innuendo. You think this is uh, the Vince McMahon show for the long haul? Yeah. It's just uh, amazing to me. Uh, I, I want to mention too, it was reported in the observer that the promoters in Japan who were promised Vince for TV tapings, because it had always been Shane and Stephanie going to these things. And that made the company uneasy. Well, they didn't know if Vince was going to be able to travel. How real was that issue from your perspective? Well, they, I mean, we knew he wasn't going. You mean beforehand or once he was injured? No, once he was injured, but. Uh, what, what are you asking? I mean, uh, no, I mean, it's not like you can help it at this point, right? Yeah. You know, it is what it is. The guy, he's, he needs to be taken care of. And the last thing he needs to go on is a uh, transcontinental flight to a international destination. <laughs> well, no kidding. Um, where the, where English is not the primary language. You've, you've sort of freestyled before what you think the, the scream sounded like you want to give us your best impression. Ow. Thank you. Ow. Ouchie. I said. <laughs> Fuck. I can't do that anymore. What do you think? Um, what do you think? Uh, Johnny a said when he realized what get happened? out of my way. <laughs> Oh, need some oil for your legs. Oh my! Your arms still look what? Your oh, arms still look great, sir. That's tremendous. What? All right, so Bruce, let's do some fan questions. Let's get to it. Uh, did Daniel Pewter know he was being hazed? He wasn't being hazed. Oh come on! That is the new guy. Welcome to the club treatment. Of course it is. He was lucky to be in the rumble. I'm grateful. Another one here. Uh, if this is not the greatest example of Vince not selling shit, what is? Oh my God. Yeah, it's up there. I mean, uh, again, he's a freak of nature. So yeah, it, it definitely was bizarre land. Uh, here's one. How, what did you think of, of triple H as a heel in this era for it against it? His best work, not his best work, just not your favorite. No, actually, you know, I think that for me, I thought that by this time that the audience really wanted Hunter as a babyface. 
and he was so comfortable and just preferred being a heel that you know that's what he wanted to do and he was very good at it uh i just think that overall probably the majority of the audience in my opinion wanted him as a baby face but he, I, look this was some fun shit you know, going back to uh, all the stuff with him and Flair and Batista and all that shit was absolutely, I thought, some of the best work any of those guys ever did. So next month, or next week rather, we close out the uh, month, the Royal Rumble month, when we look back 15 years and discuss the 20th Royal Rumble from 2007. It was the AT&T Center in San Antonio, Texas, or as you people say, San Antonio where we have three championship matches scheduled and the first rumble to include ECW. Bobby Lashley is going to defend the ECW title against test. Batista will defend the world title against Mr. Kennedy and John Cena will take on Umaga in a last man standing match for the WWE championship. And we also see the beginning of the undertaker, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania build. What else do you think we might be talking about when we talk all things, Royal rumble, 2007. Fuck if I know, I gotta watch it again. All right, you ain't gotta get hot about it. God damn. By the way, as a reminder, you get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And Bruce, I'm pretty excited. Uh, y'all are just gonna be right up the road from us. And uh, as folks are listening to this, SmackDown is in Nashville tonight. And uh, I don't know, it always seems like Nashville's a good crowd for WWE. So I'm looking forward to that one, man. I got some guys from the office who are gonna be tagging along. It should be a good time, dude. Music Cite. Can't uh, wait, can't wait. I love me some Nashville, man. Uh, you know, John Layfield and I had a, a condo there in Nashville for about a year and a half. We did some business there uh, with an energy shot, and I absolutely love Nashville to death. But you're going to be there for an afternoon, uh, coming in that morning, leaving that evening. Uh, what's the over under on me and you spending time together? I'm going to say five minutes. You got the over or the under? Yeah, right. The under He's you're so going, silly. You're going with the under. I'm going with the under. Can you just send me a picture of where you are in the building? And then maybe we could do just like track my friends or track my family. And it'll be like, Hey, we're yeah, in the same you place. Tra- yeah. You can track me that way. I'll send you my locale. You think see, you- I'm always moving, man. I'm on the go. You think hypothetically you'd be able to put me on the parking list so I can get a good parking spot. Oh, hell no. God damn it. Well, always, always wanting stuff. Always, always just hand out, hand out, wanting stuff, man. What the, a parking spot? Really? Oh yeah. Dude, it's, you know, Tennessee. What does that mean? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) All right, boys and girls. You know how we talked about the other day about like different places that that I would live. And I said, you know, Hey man, I, I, Shit, I could see myself going to to living in Huntsville. I could actually see myself living in Tennessee. Oh, for sure. Na- I mean, Nashville. Nashville specific. Chattanooga ain't bad, but Nashville is the jam. Chattanooga is not. Chattanooga is nice as shit too. But I, I like Tennessee. Yeah, no, no state income tax, and you never have to worry about the pressure of winning football games. You know, it's kind of cool. Exactly. All right, boys and girls, that'll do it for this week's edition of something to wrestle. We're going to be back next week talking about Royal rumbles again. It is rumble season. So why not? We'll see you next week right here on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard rock on. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you get a notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, It's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.